welcome back to our 21st uh, episode on off-highway vehicle design. I'm Lance from Motive Power. There are many places that diesel engine vehicles operate and some of them are pretty scary. Some of them actually are explosive and today we're going to talk a little bit about what it takes to make a diesel engine safer to run in an explosive environment. Now we know that diesel engines work by exploding things. The trick here is to keep the explosion inside the engine and not let it out. This is certainly the case with coal mining, underground coal mining vehicles. I've stood at an underground coal face in a puddle of water and watch the methane bubbling up through that water. The very air around me was explosive. And it is possible for engines to operate in that environment if you're very careful in the design and maintenance of them. And it's not just underground coal mines. There's oil refineries, chemical plants, and uh, on oil rigs, although they're just the engines, they're not in a vehicle as such. So stick with us and see what it takes to make an engine safe to work in such a hazardous environment. So let's get our terminology right. We're talking about explosion protected engines. Sometimes they're called explosion proof, but maybe nothing is ever proof. There's always a risk. And most times they're called flame proof. It really should be explosion protected. And what that's all about is keeping the bang inside the engine and not doing anything silly on the outside of the engine that might ignite an atmosphere. A couple of other terms. I'll be talking about a DES, a diesel engine system. Really, the base engine needs a lot of stuff added to it and sometimes some serious modifications to make it explosion protected. So I'm going to distinguish the engine from the engine system, the engine being a part of the diesel engine system. And another term I might use is FRAS, fire resistant anti-static. And that's typically applicable to uh, non-metallic components, plastic stuff, perhaps some rubber as well, like V-belts or plastic fan blades, that sort of thing. So fire resistant, anti-static to whatever relevant standard. And of course, there are standards and it's an evolving world out there. 40 plus years ago when I started, the British had the standards the most refined, but the Australians got fussier. Um, the nickname for our state here in Australia is the nanny state where the government tries to keep us all warm and comfy and protected. So that resulted in Australian standards that then basically became world leaders. And they're accepted in South Africa, Russia, India and so forth. And I understand the Chinese standards are based on the Australian. They've also just been revised and reissued uh, this year. They're applicable primarily to underground coal mining engines. If you want to operate on the surface, 
the most globally recognised standards are what's called ATEX. I'm not going to pronounce it, it's something French and it is uh, a development of uh, the European Union. Essentially standards that were created by independent national bodies that were part of the European Union and that's become an ATEX standard. Now that's BSEN 1834. What's happened since Brexit I'm not real sure but 1834 would still be the primary standard for things like engines on oil rigs. Um, there are pseudo standards called rig safe. Oil companies have their own standards um, which quite frankly are a joke. And you'll notice I haven't mentioned American standards. There's basically American standards. Um, they're considered a joke by the rest of the world. They're just not up to the job. Um, and I sadly uh, reference a number of people that get blown up in uh, American coal mines. Um, so I'm going to talk mainly about the Australian standards, 18 uh, AS 3584, and I'm going to talk about ATEX standards now. Um, in today's video, the Australian standard will be referencing underground coal mining, and ATEX will be referencing the, the surface world primarily the oil industry. And I should have mentioned that there's a, a new ISO IEC joint standard for explosion protected engines on the way. It's in draft stage, a um, little bit of work to finish it off, but it'll probably be out, I would suggest, by early 2024. Uh, it aims to cover everything from underground to surface engines. And it'll be interesting to see it come into force. So first we have to define what the hazards are. And I mentioned methane earlier, so that's number one. Uh, and it's the same methane in coal mining as in oil rigs because it's natural gas. But in chemical plants it could be other things, ethylene and propane and hydrogen and so forth. So an, uh, an explosive environment from a gas but dusts are also explosive. Uh, you may have be aware that flour mills and silos blow up occasionally, and that's because the very fine particles become suspended in the air in such a way that they are explosive. And if I go back to coal mining, my understanding is that an explosion there, the first explosion is probably a methane explosion that explosion and the shock wave, the pressure wave that moves down the tunnels lifts the coal dust and you get a much bigger kaboom uh, with the dust. So it's, it's um, a two for one. Thinking about what can initiate an, an explosion, well it's, it's hot temperatures, surface temperatures to start with. And if you understand that coal begins to char at 160 degrees and the, and the regulations are 150 degree maximum temperature, um, that's a lot less than a lot of engines will, um, will develop, particularly if they're turbocharged engines. Turbos tend to run a damn sight hotter than 150 degrees and the exhaust gas temperatures are too unless you do something to treat them. You can also have sparks. Now on an engine system it could be an electronic injection system um, but it could also be uh, the alternator because the vehicle that's going on will have headlights. Um, it could be static uh, for example on a V-belt if you don't use anti-static V-belts. It could also be fan blades because they're usually plastic. Um, the plastic blades are used because they're, they're twisted, they're proper fan blades, not just the old pressed brass or cast uh, blades. And then we have hot particles, basically carbon particles going out the exhaust. Yeah? That can ignite a, a gas environment. And 
Incidentally, it's the same thing in forestry. US forestry has a requirement for spark arresters to stop that. And again, in underground uh, environments, you've got gaseous emissions. So you're trying not to, to choke the people around it. Bearing in mind that the people working at a coal face are working in very close proximity to a lot of diesel engines. So assuming that you know how an engine works, Let's talk about the special requirements for an explosion protected engine or I should say an explosion protected diesel engine system. Let's go to the whiteboard. I'll draw it very simply. I'm going to draw inlet and exhaust systems. So we'll just say here's the engine here. Think of it as the block. So of course, coming in, we look at the intake system to start with. We have a filter, and from there, typically, we've got a butterfly. It's a valve that's going to open and close as a strangler. Then there'll be some sort of flame trap, and I'll talk about flame traps in a minute. and ultimately it will go into the engine. If there's a turbo, it doesn't have to be, but it could be here. This makes this stuff a little bit easier, but it could also be back here or back here. It depends on the initial design. So there's an intake system, and I will label it quickly as a filter, a strangler, And this one's a flame trap. More explanation to follow. Now, if we look on the exhaust side coming out of the engine, we're potentially going to a DPF, a diesel particulate filter, and that can either be a ceramic wall flow or a flow through type, both advantages and disadvantages. It could go through a heat exchanger to cool the gas. Then it will go to a flame trap. Then maybe a spark arrester. And then maybe a particulate filter before it goes out to the atmosphere. So let's go through these in turn. Diesel particulate filter is intended to take out the particulates. Particulates are bad and they are actually the first step in cleaning up uh, diesel engines on highway. This is a cooler to cool the gas. There's no point keeping the engine cool if the gases are hot enough to, ig to ignite things. This is also a flame trap. Spark arrester. And filter. Now, some of this is dependent upon the application. Spark arresters are primarily used on surface. But underground coal needs a spark arresting function to stop hot um, carbon particles exiting into the environment. Filters are typically underground coal so that the uh, environment the operators are in is, is as clean as possible. So this one's mainly for coal. Uh, this one as a spark arrester is typically for surface. So normally on a traditional engine, you just have an air filter and you have a muffler. 
but there's a lot more in uh, an explosion protected engine and what happens is that from this flame trap to this flame trap everything in there is considered a flame proof enclosure so any explosions in here that might happen kaboom cannot get out this flame trap stops any backfires and I don't want to hear about diesel engines can't backfire this one stops any flame getting out via the exhaust system the aim here is to stop flame getting out with flame traps the pressure will get out one way or another it's explosions the, the pressure will get out and you want to let that pressure out what you don't want to do is let the flame out a pressure spike won't blow up a mine or an oil refinery but a flame getting out will and there are some very specific ways you can design a flame trap to allow pressure to go through but not flame so let's look at how flame traps work and a bit difficult to to draw here but I'm going to give it a go I'm going to draw a plate type flame trap there are other forms particularly ribbon type I'm going to draw two plates very close together and imagine these in the gas flow so that let's say the hot exhaust gas is going in there between it those two plates and coming out the other side so imagine that in a housing the idea is that because there's a gap between those plates pressure can get through and obviously gas can get through because if this is in an exhaust system it needs to let the exhaust uh, gas out but again not the flame the purpose of having a very small gap and there might be multiples of these stacked up to give you lots of small gaps equaling uh, a larger cross-sectional area is that flame there's a ratio between that dimension and the length of what is called the flame path if the gap to the flame path is right the distance a flame has to go is sufficient to do multiple things to cool it and to starve it to cool it and so that it, the flame might go out and to starve it of oxygen because it's a very small gap and it can't get enough oxygen to self-sustain it that's the primary theory around flame traps or I should say maybe flame arresters depending on what part of the world you're from now often in an exhaust system water-based exhaust conditioners so-called scrubbers are used and they are used to do multiple things with the one essential component there are a water bath you blow the exhaust gas through the water bath it cools the gas it provides a uh, quenching activity so hot particles don't get through it has a tendency to reduce the emissions and it's also a flame arrester and if I can quickly draw it I will let's say a quick cross-sectional view exhaust pipe here hot gas coming in here and down here running out of pens a water level here such that the hot gas goes out through the water now they're not that simple but that's the comps the concept so the water will extinguish any hot particles 
and any flame that tries to come through and it will cool the, the gas. They are more complicated because attached to them has to be some sort of float valve to keep the water level right. Let's put a little hole through there. And then you've usually got some other low temperature sensor as well so that you can tell uh, I'll draw it electrically but it's generally a mechanical device so that should the water level get too low it triggers an alarm and probably a shutdown so a scrubber or exhaust conditioner can be used to do multiple things in an exhaust system the downside this takes up a lot of space the amount of water you've got to carry, because the water gets consumed, it gets turned into steam. The um, amount of water you've got to carry is considerable. And you get a lot of crap in this water. So occasionally, this valve doesn't want to work, and maybe this valve doesn't want to work, and it's a bit of a maintenance nightmare. So let's talk about some of the components that go to make up a flame-proof diesel engine system well there's the base engine from a recognized engine OEM and within that engine the pistons and the valves and the head gasket seal are considered to be uh, working and flame proof and not going to let a flame get out because if they let the flame get out the diesel engine won't work it is possible that the engine itself has hot spots, particularly on the head, and it may need either a special head or a modified head to keep those surface temperatures down. The turbochargers are often an issue because they're not made for low temperature surfaces, and you'll often find water cooled turbochargers used, usually taken from marine applications. They're cooled through the engine's cooling system. Fuel pumps get modified or certainly get adjusted. Um, the amount of fuel and the timing is important for an emissions, uh, a good emissions result. And it can vary from a little bit of change to a lot of change. Air compressors get hot, so they have to be water cooled just to keep that surface temperature down. And starters are always interesting. Very rarely is an electric starter used because we've got a, we're in an explosion protected environment. We don't want the possibility of sparks. So batteries are very much frowned upon, technically possible, but frowned upon. And again, the electric starter motor is fraught with danger. So usually it's some sort of mechanical starter. And I'm just going to use KH's OzStart website to show you some of the options. So this would be my personal preference. This is an OzStart uh, turbine air starter. And you can see all the vanes in here, the impeller, um, with the air start and the gearing and the pinion arrangement. So that would be a fairly straightforward uh, air start. Quite a simple thing to fit. And they make them for all sorts of flywheel housings. But sometimes people don't want to put air on board. Now, this is the case with a lot of uh, mobile oil rig stuff, like mud pumps, for example. And often that leads to spring starters. If you like, it's a clockwork. You wind it up and you let it go. And you hope the engine starts on the first attempt. This is a prime example. Well, <laughs> Once you've wound one of these things up, you'll never want to do it again. But they do take away the complications of electric start. There are also hydraulic starters. You've got a hydraulic system involved. It's easy to charge up an accumulator and to use it for a starter. That usually means the accumulator is a piston type accumulator, not a bladder type. 
um, bladder types are somewhat susceptible to damage with a sudden full discharge. Piston types, just basically a piston sliding in a cylinder, are uh, much more robust. But again, I'd say to you, once you've pumped one of those up, you'll never ever want to do it again and you'll go and fit an air starter, even if you don't really want to have air available on the unit. We also need to talk about pinions. The new standards, the ISO IC standard coming, is going to require non-sparking pinions. And that can be a problem. Currently there's no real special requirements. But I guess there's a potential risk that a pinion engaging in a flywheel ring gear could cause a spark, particularly if the pre-engagement isn't working. I don't believe it's ever been a problem in Australian underground coal, but the new standard is likely to require either stainless steel, which theoretically is non-sparking, or um, beryllium, which is a very nasty material to, uh, to machine. So watch out for your startup pinions and check carefully what is required by the standard you're working to. Now, the engines are essentially controlled by mechanical systems. Yes, people have fitted electronic safety systems, but they're very much discouraged. Nobody likes them. They're too complicated and expensive and troublesome to maintain over a long period. And I'm going to touch briefly on the electrical system. It's complex. It's expensive. It uh, requires a skill set that might not be available in field because we've got to keep the sparks away from the explosive environment. So yes, you can have an electrical system on a certified explosion protected DES, but it's rare and it's suboptimal. But you do have to still worry about some electrical aspects. Uh, static electricity from fans and uh, drive belts and in particular and you may need to earth things back to the block so there's no potential difference across the DES. All of these DESs require a safety system to shut it down when it starts to operate outside the requirements. That could be it's getting too hot, it could be because it's uh, running too fast. Uh, low oil pressure, low coolant pressure, there's a variety of potential shutdowns and we'll just quickly go through them. But these are typically part of a pneumatic system, a fail safe pneumatic system, so that when you lose air pressure, the fuel shuts off and the strangler on the intake closes. Now the strangler is important because if you've got an explosive atmosphere, there's a fair chance that atmosphere is essentially a fuel for the engine. It is quite possible for there to be so much methane in a mine environment that you can turn off the diesel fuel supply to the engine completely and the engine will still run. It'll give you great power, but the governor will not be able to control it because there's no diesel fuel coming in, it's all coming in with the air. And typically that engine will overspeed and go kaboom. So safety systems are crucial to not blowing up a mine or an oil rig, etc. If you want an example of an oil rig, uh, BP a Deep Horizon unit in the, uh, in the, in the Gulf, um, that blew up some years ago. There was I read the BP report. There were about 14 causes of the of the tragedy or the extent of the tragedy. The engines overspeeding and blowing up were about number 10. Apparently, the fireboat crews could hear the engines screaming and then exploding. Now, whether they were explosion protected, I I don't know. But the likelihood is they were in an area that everybody thought would never see gas. Uh, and hence they probably weren't protected. Um, if they were protected, that might have been one less cause. And if I remember correctly, uh, 
those engines drove the fire pumps and some other critical systems. So when they went, the fire was less, less likely to be controlled. So let's look at some of the sensor units that are used in this fail-safe pneumatic system. There are uh, a range of sensors depending on what you want to sense, but it would normally be temperatures and pressures. Uh, it could also be coolant level, and maybe you're going to introduce something from the driven machine as well. There are established suppliers, and one of them is Chowan. And Chowan do a range of stranglers. These are you know, can be controlled in a, in a variety of ways. This is a butterfly, and there's an actuator on the top that can be moved by pressure, by air pressure, oil pressure, spring, uh, or manual lever. They also have um, an overspeed unit. If you put too much air through, then uh, like the engine is starting to run too fast, it's drawing more air, the unit will shut off and strangle the engine. This is an, an AMOT temperature valve. It's a sensor, it's a bimetallic sensor that pops a ball off a seat and then opens to let air go through. So that's how the fail safe bit works. This end gets hot, opens the valve up here, dumps the control air and a spring-loaded fuel shut off and a spring-loaded um, strangler close and shut the engine down. There are similar type sensors for uh, various pressures and levels. There are also, primarily for underground coal, methanometers to shut the engine down when the methane levels in the environment get too high. Uh, lots of issues around them. They're always electrical, but they trigger a solenoid valve that will dump the pneumatic control pressure. So all of this safety gear has to be fail safe, so that no matter what goes wrong, you can shut it down. And that brings in functional safety. If you're going to do a, a thorough technical design job, you're going to look at the mean time between failures and the risk level that's associated with it. How reliable are the individual components? Uh, is there a, a common cause failure uh, possible? What's the architecture of your system? Is there a, an arrangement where the, the valves and sensors won't work correctly? If you've duplicated, how do you know both of those units are going to work? What's your test regime? A lot of issues go into functional safety and it is very key with this sort of equipment. So if we're talking underground, we're going to talk about emissions. And there's essentially two types. There's uh, gaseous and there's particulates. And the reason we get worried about them is it's a health thing. You're working in very close proximity to a, a diesel engine spewing fumes. Some of the gaseous emissions are harmful to life, like CO, and some are extreme irritants, like nitrous oxides. Either way, you don't want too many of them. Particulates are important for a couple of reasons. If they're very fine particles, they can basically get into your cells and maybe cross the barrier into the blood and go throughout your body and cause oxidative stress. They can also carry what I like to think of as the solvents into your body. Diesel engine exhausts have lots of things like aldehydes and hydrocarbons and yeah, that's what I call solvents, all the yucky stuff. The particulates can get that stuff into your body because that stuff is attached to the carbon particles, the elemental carbon that makes up the particulates. So particulates have a double whammy. They're a problem in themselves, but they're also a problem with the friends they carry in. So hence, um, you want low particulates in your exhaust. Uh, particulates were the first thing addressed by motor vehicle uh, emission requirements for the surface, and they're very important for the same reasons underground. Now, in a, in a mine, emissions are also a function of the ventilation. 
one of my bugbears, ventilation in mines never seems to be up to the task. It limits, the ventilation can limit the amount of vehicles used in a particular section at the same time. And that's uh, a big problem when you've got a lot of work on. If you're moving a, a, a coal mine long wall system with hundreds of very large components to be moved, with essentially big dozers and carriers and all sorts of big vehicles operating in a confined space, it needs to be very well ventilated and it needs to use engines with low emissions so that the ventilation is kept within uh, a, what's technically feasible. That's part of the reason most underground coal mining engines these days are fitted with particulate filters right at the end of the exhaust. These don't look too different to intake filter elements, but they're designed for higher temperatures. So they can take exhaust gas going through them and they effectively let zero particulates through. It's a real advance, but they're bulky, they take up space on a vehicle and you have to change them fairly regularly and they become in themselves a health hazard. Low emissions generally are achieved through fuel pump modifications and settings, possibly through water injection, uh, controlling the boost, uh, catalytic converters of one form or another, uh, either as a DPF or a cat converter, and a range of other secret techniques used to get things down. Problem is, all of that's done on a dyno originally, uh, and in the field, you don't use an engine the same way it's used on a dyno. But in fields, there's regular emissions tests to verify that the engine is still within the parameters. And I should mention too that the new standards, current Australian standards and the new standards coming are requiring emissions tests essentially to European requirements. And that's a steady state and a transient cycle. So it's getting closer and closer to surface vehicle requirements, but with different emission levels. There's no such thing as an underground coal engine that's tier four or Euro five or whatever. Once you touch the engine to turn it into a explosion protected engine with lower emissions for mining, you destroy whatever those original settings were. So don't think you can take a tier four uh, US engine, make it flame proof and put it in a mine and think it's still a tier four. It won't be. So how do you know these engines are meeting the standards? Depending on the standard, some sort of certification will probably be required. At the very least, there's type testing. Now, and that's generally done by third-party independent laboratories. There's always what's colloquially known as bang testing. You fill the engine, a dummy engine, with gas and go bang and see what pressures are achieved inside. Then you fill it with gas and you put it in a, a gas-filled enclosure. You bang what's inside the engine and see if it comes out and ignites the atmosphere around it. And then based on those uh, test results, you hydrostatically pressure test the components to make sure everything's robust enough. So, yeah, that's pain, it takes time, there's a fair few regulations, but it does give you a very good degree of confidence that it meets the standards and is relatively safe. I say relatively safe because nothing is ever completely safe, no matter how good the design. Then you put the engine on a dyno. The complete engine system from inlet to exhaust outlet with all the control systems and you flog it. You get a power curve, you run it for an hour or more, 
at uh, full load to make sure your temperatures are okay. You test all your safety shutdowns. You do the steady state and trans uh, transient emissions testing. It's a whole range of things. It'll probably take at least three weeks on a dyno and cost you a bundle of money. Um, it's a very painful thing. Sometimes you see what the engines are going through and you want to shoot it and put it out of its misery. But um, again, successful tests give you a very high level of confidence that you've met the design requirements. And part of that, of course, is the emissions testing. Very, very time consuming and worrisome. Certification currently depends on what standard you're using and where the engine will go to. The ATEC standards currently uh, require or permit self-certification. And if you're a responsible OEM, you've done your own verification and have documented that so that you can show a client that you meet the standards. Uh, if it's a coal engine in this country, has to be certified and registered uh, in this state with, uh, with government, the mines department, and um, that's a fairly common thing out here. If it's going on an oil rig, the situation becomes a little more complicated. The oil rig is generally in international waters. So no one's really sure what the regulations are. Uh, for the record, the IMO standards are for propulsion engines, so flame-proof engines don't fit into that category. The situation in the US is a big mystery at the moment because US engines are supposed to be T4 or T5 or something. Um, and they are actively restricting engines that aren't meeting those standards. Explosion protected engines don't meet those standards. They meet different standards. So it's a difficult one in the US. But generally anything on an oil rig will, should be done to ATEX at this point and doesn't require uh, government authority, government certification or third party. But one of the key things with keeping a, a, an explosion protected engine system like that able to be relatively safe is maintenance. It is incredibly important that the engines are kept in good condition. I do hear stories about oil rig engines where the uh, exhaust uh, Flame arrestor has been uh, clogged and instead of it being cleaned and returned, it's thrown overboard. Um, that won't help you when there's a fire on the oil rig and your engine goes a bit berserk. Um, you really need to keep things in, in a maintained condition. Coal mining underground, it's still a cowboy operation no matter how many regulations you put in it. I've seen so many engines blown up and destroyed because somebody decided that it was end of shift and they wanted to get out of the mine so they just ran it till it blew up and maybe they made it to the surface. It's quite common for the people who you are trying to protect to actively override the protection devices and that is particularly the case with methanometers. People don't like them going off so they turn them off and hence they have no idea they're in a high methane environment that's very dangerous for coal engines here there's a mandatory code d inspection that's a nominal two yearly inspection where it's not a full disassembly but it is an inspection of all critical componentry and the scheduled emission tests to make sure they're not fumigating the miners